Do you have fear of rejection? Difficulty trusting others? Low self-esteem? Difficulty forming healthy relationships? A sense of isolation? Perfectionism? Difficulty in receiving love and affection? You might be dealing with an orphan spirit. An orphan spirit, people who have it, have a fear of developing deep connections with others because they fear being rejected and abandoned. They have a struggle to trust others, especially authority figures of people in positions of power. They feel unworthy of love, support, and they struggle with their feelings of inadequacy all the time. They have difficulty forming and maintaining healthy relationships and become overly dependent on others or push them away. Sometimes people with an orphan spirit feel disconnected from others and have a sense of loneliness and emptiness. The way that others manifest or see the fruits of this spirit of orphan, orphan spirit is they strive for perfection in order to gain approval and acceptance by feel like they could never measure up. They struggle to accept love and affection from other people and feel like they don't deserve that or it's not genuine if somebody loves them. Spiritual orphans are often angry when others received honor. The spiritual orphans find little joy in their ministry. They have an attachment to God that's usually based on what they do not based on His love. They detach themselves from those people that are they're angry with and they have inability to recognize the blessings, see their spiritual blessings. Now you may say, Where, what is this spiritual orphan or a orphan spirit? In a nutshell, orphan spirit is a state of mind and emotion characterized by feelings of abandonment, rejection, loneliness, and lack of belonging. It manifests in many different ways and there are some common traits which I'm going to address in just a moment. Now, Jesus said in Luke chapter 14 verse 18, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. So he is not speaking of physical orphans, which the Bible tells us to take care of physical orphans. He's speaking about spiritual orphans, which tells us that there are physical orphans and there are spiritual orphans. And you might not be a physical orphan, but you can be a spiritual orphan. When we experience wounds from our family of origin, it damages our relationships, it affects our spiritual life and it hinders us from breaking sinful habits down the road. These wounds we receive in our childhood, a lot of times through neglect, abuse, harsh words or parents who themselves had a very difficult time managing their own life and they neglected or didn't know how to properly raise their children and maybe they lived in the cycle of hurt, abuse, neglect, harsh words because it was done to them and they simply just passed on the same things that were passed on to them and this cycle damages children, young people and then they become adults and they relive and these wounds that have been neglected, they became infected. And when they became infected, then they infect everything else in our lives. There are three common roles spiritual orphans assume. And this was by Rick and Sue McCoy from Abba's Arms Ministry, our Abba's Arms International Ministry. And Rick and Sue so, so say that the first way that an orphan acts is a victim or the victim. The role that they take on is the victim. They cannot deal with the wounding, so they give in to pain, which leads to feelings of loneliness, which leads to deeper inner pain. A victim is somebody who has feelings of self-pity, depression, despair, 
and life without hope. A victim is somebody who has the thoughts of life have become too painful for him or her to live with and they desire to die. Some victims, the root of it is really the spirit of orphan, the, the heart of an orphan, that abandonment, that rejection, that isolation that usually started when we were children and it kind of went into our teenage years, into our young adult years and then it really manifests itself in our adult years and we begin to take on this facade, this, this role of a victim. Some victims are numbing their pain with alcoholism, drug addiction, chronic depression and they're void of emotions, feelings and have no motivation for life or just do anything. And that's one of the ways that spirit of orphan manifests is the victim. The second way that the spirit of orphan manifests is the persecutor. The persecutor is somebody who fights against the wounding, meaning they got hurt and they recognize that they got hurt and they fight against the people who hurt them and they develop deep feelings of bitterness, hatred and rebellion against anyone and everyone who even looks or reminds them of people that hurt them. These people become abusers, hyper-perfectionists, workaholics, troublemakers, activists and inflexible. They get their identity from what they do, not who they are. Rarely do they acknowledge their need for change. And actually, these persecutors sometimes can end up in occultism, being part of occultism because of that deep root of hurt, a wound, rejection, isolation that takes on the role of either a victim, the victim or the persecutor. But there's one more role that the spirit of orphan takes on and that is the rescuer. It's when wounding creates a deep inner agony so that they begin to struggle against that wound. They become indifferent to the hurt and take on superficial happiness. They find recognition in being in a spotlight. They may become talkative, aggressive, loud, charismatic and enjoy the praise of men. They want to help everybody with their pain and change the world so it will no longer be such an evil place that hurt them. They do have a difficulty in acknowledging their own need for healing because they do so many good things and the motivation to rescue everyone is actually coming from a deep wound from their past. They do the good things but for all the wrong reasons. They're numbing that pain. They're motivating that pain as well by all the good works. Sometimes they become counselors, even pastors nurses and doctors, social workers and public servants. They may have started as victims or, per or persecutors, but their consciousness leads them to become a rescuer so that they can feel good about themselves and make a peace with their past. There's usually very little anointing on their efforts, even if those efforts are great. An orphan. It's a very dangerous place to be in when an orphan becomes a leader. When a spiritual orphan takes the place in the church and the position in the church of a leader. Um, pastor and I think an apostle Joseph Matera uh, mentioned 13 traits of orphan spiritual leaders, spiritual orphan leaders. And as I was kind of looking to 10 traits, as I was looking over that, I was examining my own heart because it is possible to experience that where you are in leadership and as I'm going to mention that, some of you will recognize some of the leaders that you are under and some of you who are leaders, you will recognize that inside of you. This is not to point finger at anybody. This is to address an issue 
so that we can go to the root of it today and with the help of the Holy Spirit, help us to deal with that. And so the 10 traits of orphan, spiritually orphan leaders are as followed. Is this helping anybody? If it is, drop in the chat that you are already receiving something already. Let me know that you are engaged with me. Hit like to this video if you are just tuning in and share this with other people as well. The signs of spiritual leaders who have an orphan spirit is number one, they are hypersensitive. Number two is they don't know how to be a spiritual parent. Number three is they're always in competition with other leaders. Number four is they are driven by search for significance. Number five is they don't know how to emotionally connect. Number six is they don't feel good about themselves. Number seven is they don't know how to treat others. Number eight, they do not interpret reality correctly. Number nine is these people are, ob these leaders, they objectify these leaders. They use people as means to reach their goal. And number 10 is they're always looking for approval and recognition. They don't know how to submit to spiritual authority and they have a difficult time with their own family. They have a difficult time relating to God as their father. So this list was provided by Joseph Matera, but I believe it gives us a really good insight that a lot of leaders today, a lot of people, even in the family who have biological children, yet they are experiencing spiritual orphans. And these, this orphan life on the inside, full of isolation, full of rejection, full of a sense of difficulty trusting people, low self-esteem, difficulty forming other relationships, perfectionism, difficulty in receiving love and receiving affection. What it does is it, it builds these bitterness roots these hurts and these wounds that get neglected. And over time, we just cover them and cover them, put band-aids over them. And we get ourselves more busy and more busy, hoping that it will just go away. Time will heal. Everything will be fine. You know, we get education then we get new position in church. And then we have these encounters with God that seem to increase anointing in our life. But that, that aching thing is there and it's like underground driving a lot of our decisions and polluting our motivations. In the Bible, there's a good example of an orphan spirit person. And this person is an older brother of the prodigal son. And that's who I want to address right now and kind of highlight five specific, I would say signs or behaviors of an orphan spirit from the story of the prodigal son. Now, the story that I'm going to extract it from is actually from the older brother, not the younger brother. The younger brother, you know, was a freebie, a, re a little rebel. He just kind of went, did his own thing and committed a lot of sins, lost all of his inheritance. The older brother in this story actually was worse. I believe he was worse because the end of the story of the older brother, the older brother we see is outside of the house, arguing with his father. And the story ends there. We don't know if he ever went in. The younger brother came back to the father. He repented. He got the father's love. The older brother left the father's house and was on the outside, angry, upset, arguing. And we don't see him coming back in. It's, it's like these two sons had problems. One of them was a very visible problem on the outside, you know, sin, wasteful living. That was the younger son. And, and we preach so many stories about the younger son, you know, prodigal living, all the stuff. And that has its place. But the older one is the one that never left the house in the beginning. But there was something wrong with his relationship with his dad. And I'm just going to highlight five of these traits. 
the first trait of an orphan, orphan spirit or behaviors. That you, and, and I want us to examine ourselves. And this is not something I'm just sharing with you as we are praying and fasting. This is something that I'm sharing it with myself as well. It's, it's a constant, I feel like, checkup that I need to do with my own heart that I don't operate. I don't live out of an orphan spirit and that I deal with that. And I'm going to finish this teaching with sharing some of the things that we can do today to see that we address the root and deal with the root. So the first trait is that orphan spirit brings out anger. Luke chapter 15, 28, it says that the older brother was angry. Something about this orphan spirit is that it gets triggered with anger that controls a person. Now, anger is a healthy emotion. It just shows that something was violated in your values, something was broken or somebody broke it and you get angry. Jesus got angry. The Bible says, be angry, but do not sin. But this anger was different. It drove him out of the house. It made him shut down. It made him be a person that's not receptive. He took it, it became this bitterness that's inside of him. You listen to what he said to his dad, how he treated his brother. Like this guy was extremely unhealthy angry and that's one of the orphan spirits is that they, they have these outbursts of anger sometimes that anger is very visible and sometimes that anger is just kind of inside bottles into frustration and then th that moment where the volcano just explodes because the person just can't take it any longer and it's really fueled by a lot of rejection isolation some wounds and sometimes even abuse the second way that the older brother exemplified or I would say manifested the orphan spirit is that he was pushed into isolation. The Bible says he would not go in. And then he said things about his younger brother as, this, as soon as this son of yours came, meaning he disassociated himself from his own brother. He didn't say, as soon as my brother came in. He said to his dad, as soon as your son, who happens to be his brother, meaning there was an isolation that took place. Now, there's a difference between isolation and solitude. Solitude is healthy. Isolation is toxic. Isolation says, they are my problem. And that's not healthy but toxic people they make us feel like we are the problem so there's isolation which is dangerous a lot of times it's kind of coming from that orphan spirit and then there's the toxic people who want to tell you that you're the problem and both of those are not healthy extremes to be in i remember in my younger years i battled heavily with this orphan spirit when I would be invited to birthday parties as a teenager, I would come up to the house of a person that I was invited and I would sit in the car and drive back home and I wouldn't go in. Sometimes I would go in and I would sit just on the couch, not talk to anybody, feel like everybody's rejecting me, feel like nobody wants to talk to me and just leave. Even when I was a leader already, there was this thing where I carried this deep on inside that I don't belong here. So I would come and I would instantly leave. And this would reaffirm my feelings of I'm rejected. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares about me. And I would drive myself into deep isolation a lot of times. Thankfully, I would find myself not only in isolation, but seek God in the midst of that. And God helped me to get out of that and helped me for it not to turn into anything that could potentially destroy my life. So I still, even as I'm speaking right now, I, f I remember those feelings. I see those images, not in a negative trigger way, but in the way of what God delivered me from and what God took me from. Interestingly that you know, that came, a lot of that came is because of the way I was born, which later on, what people said about me, the bullying that I experienced in school, the name calling, and I kind of took on that new identity that was given to me by my appearance, that was given to me by my peers, and that was given to me by the circumstances that I, that I encountered. 
It wasn't, I didn't experience abuse from my family. I didn't experience neglect from my family. I grew up in a very healthy and very godly home of uh, mom and dad that loved us, brothers and sisters that were very kind. And we had a very good family environment. But as I started to grow older, the pressure from the society and my peers and my own lack of knowing who I am, I took on an identity that reinforced these feelings of insecurity, inability to receive love, a need to prove something, perform so that I will be accepted, and honestly, deep, deep isolation. And it took a while to peel those layers off and break that through so that I could walk in the inheritance God has for me. The third sign of or the third behavior, the third way that the orphan spirit will manifest in your life is, and we see this in the older son, is a sense of entitlement, feeling like you've been treated unfairly, constant demanding, and a controlling attitude. See, it starts as a victim. Nobody loves me. I am rejected. And the moment you give them, the person with an orphan heart, a little bit of position, a little bit of gifting, a little bit of um, opportunities, something else switches. It's like a switch that happens. You go from the victim to the prosecutor. You go into this person that's very different, into entitlement. I'm treated unfairly, demanding constantly respect and honor. And control. There's nothing wrong with a sense of teaching people that, you know, honor and respect and dignity is supposed to be given to people in authority, da, 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 da. Credit is supposed to be given, but it's very different when it's a motivation and a drive in a Christian environment, Christian home, Christian business, or Christian church. And a lot of times we pastors have that. We leaders have that. And of course, we blame it on our people. Our people just don't understand. They don't just honor us. And there could be some truth in that. But if you dig a little bit deeper, you could see this older brother syndrome, orphan spirit. Look what he said in Luke 15, 29. Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgress your commandment at any time. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I may marry, that I make marry with my friends. Interestingly, never. Look at how he views himself. I never did anything wrong. I'm always working harder than anybody else. And then his view of his father, you never gave me a young goat. His dad gave him the whole inheritance and the guy is whining about a goat. And how can that be? Oh, that's very, that's very simple. That's very easy to explain because all of us have felt that. Now it's fine. Once in a while we get tempted with that, but it's different when it's constantly living on the bottom, like deep part of your soul. I always work harder. I do better than other people. I put in all the time and yet I never get recognized. I never, 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 never. You know, God is ignoring me. I never do this. I never, you know, like, and this, these sense of entitlements, being treated unfairly, constantly demanding for your rights, constantly trying to control the situation or other people. It's actually could be one of the clearest signs that you have an orphan heart that needs to be fixed. Is this helping anybody? If you are watching and right now this is helping you, drop number one in the chat and I'm going to just continue uh, with the teaching. The fourth sign, I would say symptom in the older brother's story that co directly correlates with the orphan spirit is orphan spirit is jealous when others are promoted. Luke 15, 30, we see that son older son said to his dad, as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. We see jealousy when others are promoted. A sense of we need to be equal, you know, but they're not equal. Younger brother just received the party. The older brother has the inheritance. And 
There's a jealousy that's involved in that. Cain killed his brother Abel over jealousy. King Saul sought to kill David over jealousy. Pharisees sought to kill Jesus over jealousy. See, I believe when we see somebody being recognized, promoted, rewarded, and blessed by God, it exposes our silent frustrations. The feeling of being overlooked, ignored, and passed by. It's like God doesn't notice you anymore. He's not blessing you, but He's blessing somebody else. And all of those feelings and sometimes connected to the pain and hurt and words that we were called and experiences that we had that were negative, all of that begins to surface and jealousy and envy begins to appear. But in reality, we're frustrated with God. We're frustrated with life and we just feel like things are just not fair. Someone's promotion exposes our frustration. Someone being recognized reminds us that we are overlooked. Someone being rewarded reminds us we got ignored. Someone being promoted reminds us we got passed over. And we begin to take matters into our own hands. You know, and it's possible to experience that, live in that, and it can jeopardize your ministry. And most importantly, is not only your ministry, your business. It will hurt your inner life. It will drain your life on the inside. You will not be able to be at peace with you. Have joy that's abundant. Have love that's flowing like a river inside of you. The relationship with God becomes very, very bad because God becomes somebody that is difficult to trust. He's the one that technically becomes responsible for this unfairness that you are experiencing. You know, in the, when I was a teenager, um, this was kind of heavy for me. This, 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 this particular topic was hard because I always felt that other people were better, uh, more gifted. They were given better opportunities. They had a good start in life. They were better looking, um, better gifts, skills wired differently. Their personalities um, were better. And it's almost like I loved everybody's life except my own. I wasn't very comfortable in my own skin. And I'm not just talking about my appearance. I, had, I was not comfortable with my personality. I wasn't comfortable with my strengths. I thought they were wild, crazy, not like normal. I wasn't comfortable with my weaknesses. And I'm not talking about sinful inclinations, but just weaknesses, the things that I'm not good at. And so it seemed like everywhere I looked and what I saw, I just, I didn't like it. And of course that really hardened my relationship with God. I had a hard time trusting Him because He made me in His image and likeness and I just didn't like what I saw. I didn't like what I observed. And you know, all of that came because of that root of an orphan spirit. It's one of the manifestations, one of the fruits of an orphan spirit. You know, and God didn't change none of those things on the outside for me. But things on the inside started to change. And when they did, um, I still have the same strengths and weaknesses, maybe improved a little bit in some areas. But at the same time, my view and attitude has really been changed. Now, I wish I would tell you, I never struggled with an orphan spirit again and like happy ever after. I'll be lying because that's not true. Uh, I do feel that I have victory over that, but it's one of those things that I have to keep on standing in that victory. And sometimes if I am not careful or if I walk away from walking in my spiritual armor, then I slide back into those feelings. It, it could hit me again. And so today I want to teach you on how to overcome that in just a moment. But there's one more characteristic of the older brother that is closely connected to an orphan spirit. And that is spiritual orphans cannot access their inheritance. So number five, spiritual orphans cannot access their own inheritance. And the father looked at the son and says, you're always with me. All I have is yours. Yet the older brother couldn't access it. 
So let's review. We've mentioned that a spiritual orphan is someone who has a state of mind and emotion that is characterized by feelings of abandonment, rejection, loneliness, and lack of belonging. The way that the spirit orphan or spiritual orphan manifests is either through a person taking the role of the victim, the persecutor, or the rescuer. We said that Jesus calls us that He will not leave us as orphans, but He will come to us. And He's not referring to physical orphans because He didn't have physical children. He's talking about the spiritual orphan heart that we could develop if we are not close to Him, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. When we experience wounds from our family and our family of origin, it could damage our relationship with ourselves, our spiritual life, and hinder us from breaking sinful habits down the road. And we mentioned that in the story of the prodigal son, we've seen these five main traits of the orphan spirit. It brings out anger. It pushes us into isolation. It carries a sense of entitlement, unfairness, demanding and controlling. It's a jealousy that when others are promoted, we get overly jealous. And orphan spirit cannot access their inheritance. Now, Let's deal with how to overcome this. And I'm just going to share with you um, just very simple five things that you can do. Honestly, you can start doing today. But before we do that, go ahead and let me know if this is already helping you. Drop that prayer or fire emoji in the chat where you are watching if this is already helpful or if you are ready for how to overcome an orphan spirit. My point in this teaching is not to make anybody feel worse than they already feel, but to shine the light on the stuff under surface so that we can bring God's truth to deal with that. So share this right now. Hit like to the live stream if you haven't on YouTube. Share this on Facebook as well. And if you are re-watching, you are welcome. Uh, for those of you who are re-watching or re-listening and maybe you're like, man, why can't he just get on with the teaching? I'm listening. You're breaking the flow. I do have to stop and kind of give you a chance to breathe as well as to break the flow in our stream. And we are resuming right now. How do I overcome an orphan spirit? I'm going to give you just five practical things you can do today. Number one is you have to trust in God's love. This is very basic, but it's extremely profound. The Bible says that God is a loving father. Jesus told us to address him as a father who cares for his children. When you trust in God's love and provision, it will help you to overcome feelings of abandonment and rejection. 1 John 3.1 Maybe you need to memorize this verse. See what great love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called children of God. And that is who we are or what we are. God is not just your creator or savior. He's your father. Now this becomes very difficult for people who had bad fathers or those who never had fathers or those who were abused by their fathers. Please understand, the idea of father, you can't remove that just because you were hurt by it. You have to go to the real, heavenly, loving, perfect father. And he will help you to deal with the rest of the stuff. The cure, if you got hurt by a father, you can be healed by a father. Maybe not the same one, but a different one, the heavenly father. Jesus launched His ministry, but before He did, His heavenly Father pronounced a public affirmation of Jesus and said, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus didn't do yet miracles, healings. He hasn't died on the cross. He already came on this earth. That was part of humbling Himself. But none of these ministry works were done yet. He didn't fast for 40 days yet. Yet there was a revelation, an expression, public declaration. This is my son. I love him. I'm very pleased with him. God didn't say that after Jesus died. 
as a stamp of approval. Now you are loved. He said that before Jesus started the ministry, we have to trust. Now, sometimes you experience God's love. You're in the worship setting. You go to a retreat. Somebody teaches on God's love. You go to the altar and like a water flood passes through you and it washes away rejection. It washes away abandonment. You have that one big encounter. But I believe we all need regular encounters with the love of the Father. We also need regular reminders and mind renewal that He is the Father. The word, the, the original word that, that the New Testament was written in, is, is, it's the Abba, like Daddy. It's this tender thing. Now, I am not in any way advocating to start calling, you know, your Heavenly Father, you know, Daddy or anything. Not against that. If you're just beginning your walk with Christ, but the idea is this tender, tender, precious thing that the child looks at her dad in full trust and says, Daddy, that's really how God wants us to approach Him, where our heart, our spirit cries out, Abba, Dad. You know, He's like our Papa, our, our Father. And with that Father, out of that Father flows this love that is undeserving, that's pure, that's so healing. And when that love flashes, just, just rushes down your soul, through your soul, it cleanses the parts of you that maybe were wounded, so now they can heal. It's like that oil that just rushes, and you feel that you are loved. Because all of our wounds really come from one source, somebody who didn't love us. And they may abuse, called us with names, things they did to us, but in reality, at the root of all our hurt, someone didn't love us. The root of all our healing is meeting someone who loves us. And that's someone who loves us, not because we are good, not because we have a potential to be good, but because He is good. And that's someone. Jesus introduced us to this someone. He says, our Father. When you pray, say our Father, meaning trust in the Father's love. Drop this in the chat. Trust in the Father's love. When feelings of abandonment and rejection, when your mind plays tricks and says, no, they don't want me here. They don't love me. Look how this person spoke to me. Oh, maybe you're married. And, you know, your husband, you want to have intimacy with your wife and, you know, she's not in the mood. And, and then the enemy begins to pull the, oh, look, you, you're not good enough. You're not wanted. And the enemy plays these lies like a record. You have to right away dismantle them by leaning on something that is completely contrary to what the enemy is saying. And that is, I am loved by God. And that love is sufficient. And that love is enough. I trust in that love. I lean on that love. Sometimes I feel loved, but other times I know I am loved. Drop this in the chat. Sometimes I feel loved by God. Other times I know I am loved by God. And the reason why I'm saying that is because there are times you will not feel. Why? Because God's love is more than emotion. God's love is the cross. God's love is devotion. God's love is sacrificial. The Bible says love doesn't boast. Love is not arrogant. Love is kind. Love is patient. It's interesting that in all of those descriptions about love in Corinthians 13, he doesn't say love is a feeling. Love is the cross. So sometimes I don't feel God loves me. You know what helped me to overcome that because I didn't have a problem that my mom and dad didn't love me. I didn't have that. I, I grew up, I was very fortunate to grow up in a godly family. But there was that time that like that, that, that aching thing, like does God love me? Like theologically, yeah, I know it says in the word, 
but experientially and like on the level of my heart and my conscious level, subconscious level, it was difficult. There was this wrestling. And what helped me is two things. One of them is to experience God's love when I would worship and pray and the Holy Spirit poured out the love of God in my heart. And the Holy Spirit makes God's Father's love so real where you feel it, where you drink it like water. You experience it. You feel it in your body, in your soul. And that's incredible. But there's a second part of that. And that was when I wasn't feeling it and getting bombarded with feelings of rejection, abandonment and all of that. Then what I had to do and what I'm encouraging you to do is I had to intentionally look to the cross. I had to remind myself that I know He loves me because of the cross. He loves me. For God so loved the world. It doesn't just say because He sent the Holy Spirit to pour His love into my heart. It says because He gave His Son for me. So I can never for the rest of my life have a reason to doubt God's love because His death on the cross, Jesus' ultimate sacrifice, for a rebel like me is God's statement, proof that no matter how I feel, whether I feel the Spirit pouring the love into my heart every day or I feed myself with the truth of what God's Word says, that I am loved because Jesus died. And that helps to kind of break the grip of the orphan heart because the orphan heart runs on one battery, lack of love. Nobody loved me. Nobody cared enough. Nobody thought I was valuable. Nobody accepted me. Nobody valued me. Nobody brought me in. People just abandoned me. They overpassed me, just all of that. And the moment you hit at the heart of the orphan heart, and that is, I'm loved then you cripple the orphan heart. You break that orphan spirit. It, it, it no longer can operate in its full function. When you just learn about that. If you are in that place right now where you are struggling, especially if you've been abused, you've been rejected, cheated on, abandoned, overlooked, and layers of layers of experiences you have had, just added to that thing where you're not good enough. Maybe you're watching me and you're a teenager and you've been called with names by people that you trusted. Or perhaps you were taken advantage of sexually by people that should have been there to protect you. And this idea that God loves you is so strange and foreign. You're like, absolutely not. I don't believe that. Because if He did love me, why would He allow those things to happen to me? I don't have an answer for that. What I do have an answer for is that I do know God loves you and I have a proof for that. It's the scars in Jesus' hands and it's the scars in His side and it's the scars in His feet. Those are the signs I need and you need that you're deeply loved. And if you lean on that love, it doesn't mean that things that somebody did are okay now. No, they're not. But they can, while they stole your past, they won't have the power to control your future something will be removed. It's almost like they will be disconnected from your future and they will just be scars of your past, not the wounds that you keep carrying into your future. Trust in God's love. That's the first thing that we must do. We must experience it and we also must know it. So it's both. It's knowing that God loves me through the teachings of the scripture because of the cross and through the Holy Spirit, we experience that love meaning I feel God's presence and in God's presence, that's one thing you probably have all experienced. When God's presence comes, whether it's during worship, whether it's during reading of the scriptures, whether it's during a fellowship and you feel this overwhelming presence of Jesus, what's one thing that you feel when God's presence comes upon you? It's love. You experience God by feeling that love. Why? Because God is love. And so when you experience God's presence, sometimes you, you sense a deeper holiness, awareness, but there's one thing that runs through God's presence all the time is a sense of love. 
The second thing that we must do to overcome, or we can do, and that is to embrace our identity in Christ. I want you to drop this in the chat. Embrace your identity in Christ. The Bible teaches that believers are adopted into God's family through faith in Jesus Christ and embracing your identity can help you with feelings of loneliness and lack of belonging. The Bible says in Christ we are all the children of God through faith, Galatians 3, 26. So not only I experienced the love of the Father, which Holy Spirit helps to make it real. And I can ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, reveal, pour love of, G of the Father into my heart. But there is a second thing that we must do, and that is this, is we must embrace our identity in Christ Jesus. What begins to happen with a lot of us, when we are wounded and when we are hurt, when we have feelings of isolation, Reje rejection, abandonment, when we have inferiority, inability to receive love, give love, then self-entitlement, um, demanding for fairness, all of those things begin to kind of step in that are, they're just not healthy from a healthy place, but from a toxic, wounded place, it usually runs from our, comes from our family of origin. It's the way we kind of been treated. It's the way our family is usually. And we, we portray that on every place we work, on every place where we serve, and on every place where we are leading or the place where we are belonging with somebody. But one of the characteristics of that is that we begin to make our identity, who we are, our value from other things. And I understand you probably have heard this before and I've shared this a lot on my, in my teachings. It's one of my strong um, teachings because it's part of my testimony is to not draw identity from our appearance, our accomplishments, our accolades, our academics and all other A's that you can think of, our work, our lack of it. As Christians, we have something that we need to be taught this is not just something you experience, it's something that you have to be explained. And that is this, God sent Jesus not only to die for you, but for you to die with Him. Drop this in the chat. God sent Jesus not only so that He can die for you, but so you can die with Him. So Jesus is not just our substitute. He's also our identification. Let me explain. Jesus died for me and I died with Him, according to Romans chapter 6. Drop this in the comments below. Jesus died for me. That's substitution for my sins. But also I, I, died with Him. What is that for? Identification. Identity. Which is why we get water baptized. One of the reasons is to identify with His death, burial, and resurrection. New Testament has over, if I'm not mistaken, 70 verses of identifying Christians not with their behavior, success, appearance, even gender, but identify Christians with Christ. In Him, new creation. No condemnation, those who are in Him. All things have passed away in Him. In Him, in Him, in Him, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, Christ in you, you in Christ. It's all, it's like New Testament is bleeding with this one truth. Christians aren't just forgiven by Jesus. They're hiding in Him. The Bible says, you are of God, you are in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. Of God, meaning God, makes it so that Christ didn't just die for me. He allowed me, included me in Him. Now, why is that important? It changes everything concerning our identity. We no longer draw our identity from external sources. We draw our identity from Christ. And these are not just like mind over matter, like we just think it's, because we think it, it is so. 
Um, not really. Jesus says he died and we are included in him. So as he rose from the dead, we rise to walk in new life. Because of God, you are in Christ who has become for you righteousness, wisdom, sanctification. We are in Him. That means my identity comes from Christ. And so one of the things that you can do is take verses that deal with in Christ and focus on them. I would encourage you to take uh, a book. Watchman Nee has a very good book called A Normal Christian Life. Read that book. Listen to that. Or Andrew Womack has a book on spirit, soul, and body. Whatever that you need to do, take the verses out of the Bible. I remember one of the things that I had to do, and sometimes I keep coming back to that. Even as I am growing in ministry, I never want my ministry to be my identity. Because I'm not going to be in heaven making videos, preaching sermons, writing books, and um, healing other people, praying for other people, witnessing to other people, uh, delivering other people. That's not going to be my, my identity. That's not my identity. That's, that's not who I am. I am a child of God. I am redeemed. I am washed by Jesus. I am new creation. I no longer have condemnation. Those are, that's my identity, not what I do. And it's so easy to lose the sight of who I am because I'm so busy doing stuff. And so what I would do is I would go and actually take all the verses out of the New Testament, which deals with in Him, in Christ, and I would review them. There were times I would actually physically write all of them out after I printed them. Sometimes I wrote them a few times just to kind of take a moment and renew my mind that I have something in Jesus that is just incredible. No other religious leader ever offered, first of all, to die for my sins. And secondly, <laughs> they never included me in them. Christ included you with Him, in Him. So His death wasn't only substitution, it was also inclusion. You were included and that's amazing. Which means my identity doesn't come from what people say, do, what I did, how I look and my behavior. I'm not only loved, but I identify with Jesus. I am in Jesus. You know, we live in a culture today where people identify with stuff that's just not real. Like, you know, guys identify as women, um, uh, as females. And I saw this humorous um, graphic where a uh, bicyclist identified as a cyclist um, and was competing in a, uh, in a race <laughs> on a motorcycle because he identified as that. And you know, of course, it's bizarre, it's funny, and it's, it's bad. But... The Bible says that Christians identify with Christ. And this is not fixed in some kind of imagination. This is fixed in reality. Jesus did die for us. We died in Him. I was crucified with Christ. No longer I live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that now I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Your identity is directly connected to Christ. I have messages that I've taught specifically on that last year called Living Dead uh, in Christ and other messages. I would, if that's what you're battling with, I would encourage you to go through that. You don't want to do ministry out of a place of love deficiency and identity crisis. You don't want to lead your family. You don't want to lead your business out of these two feelings lack of love and confused about your identity. Your identity has to be anchored in Jesus. And love is Jesus, is the Father's love in you. So that's the two things that I would encourage. In my experience, I would like take verses where the Bible would talk about how my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And I would take verses where the Bible would say that, you know, I'm justified and I'm a new creation and all of this. And I would memorize them. I would repeat them. And I would just literally like brainwash my mind. Hey, Vlad, you are not what you look. You are not what you weigh. You are not your grades. You are not your English. You are not your status in America. At the time I had a green card. You are not, you're not those things. You're not even a demon slayer. You're a disciple. You are loved. 
you are new creation. Things that have to do with my being, not with my doing. And so that was huge for me. And it still is. It's still one of those things that I keep revisiting, keep revisiting to constantly remind myself, I am loved, I am a son, and I'm not what I do. I am who God says I am. The third thing that we must do in order to overcome orphan spirit, and that is forgive those that hurt you. Drop this in the chat. Forgive those that hurt hurt you. Forgiveness is the key component to heal and be delivered from an orphan spirit. Holding on to bitterness, resentment keeps us stuck in a victim mentality. Colossians 3.13, it says, bear with each other, forgive each other. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as God has forgiven you. If someone keeps coming up, if someone's behavior keeps triggering something and you remember what they did, you need to forgive them. Forgive them from the heart. Now, forgiving somebody does not mean that you are overlooking what they did. It doesn't mean you're minimizing and it doesn't mean that what they did is not bad. It doesn't in any way mean that they get away with it. Forgiving them doesn't mean that they are not going to face consequences by God. Forgiving them doesn't mean you have to do it when they ask for forgiveness. Some people that have caused us harm don't know they caused us harm. And sometimes it's wise to go and face them and tell them what they did was wrong. Especially if you were younger and, um, and uh, maybe innocent and just like you absolutely just kind of went along with it and to say, hey, what you did was wrong. Sometimes we need to report it to the police. But one thing that we do need to do is not to wait until they repent, apologize before we forgive. Otherwise, that day may never come. Jesus forgave people when He was on the cross and they, we don't see them asking for forgiveness. When Stephen was forgiving people who were stoning him, they seemed to be doing what they felt was right. But Stephen forgave them. And so forgiving is releasing, releasing that unforgiveness, that bitterness, that offense. And at first it seems like, oh, it's, it's so risky because bitterness and unforgiveness gives us a reason to be angry, gives us a reason to, to stay mad, gives us a reason to honestly feel like a victim. We have something to talk about constantly, how we were treated. We have something to constantly refer to. We, we literally, it gives us a sense of meaning. For some people, their hurt and pain gives them identity. Because nobody would rather, nobody would talk to them because they have nothing else interesting to talk about except how somebody wounded them and somebody hurt them. There's nothing wrong with sharing your testimony, but it's different if you begin to draw identity and you begin to literally feel empowered to some degree as a victim by constantly taking trips and visits to the places where you were wounded, you were hurt. You have to let them go. Your dreams have to be bigger than your nightmares. Your future has to be bigger than your past. God's promise has to be bigger than the pains you've experienced by the hands of people. And so we all have to do that. To some degree, some of us have to forgive ourselves, even though it's not in the scriptures to forgive ourselves. The Bible says to forgive others. But if you constantly kind of have this thing, man, I, I've Man, I made that mistake. Why did I do that? Well, you just have to just kind of remind yourself, if Christ has forgiven me, I choose not to hold anything against me. Some of us have bitterness toward God and we need to repent for that. Why did He allow that? You know, we kind of hold Him responsible for that. We hold Him guilty or we hold Him almost like hostage. Lord, you know, you should have not. You could have, you know, it's almost like I would have done better if I would be you, God. You know, and you have to deal with that and just release that and say, Lord, I'm sorry for not thinking, seeing you as good thinking I'm smarter, better, and I'm a better God. Lord, I'm just releasing, I'm letting that go. It's almost like I'm forgiving. I'm just releasing, re letting that go. I'm not saying you need to forgive God because God, God isn't wrong. But our view of God could be wrong. Our feelings toward God based on what he feel, we feel like He owed us or He was supposed to do or He just kind of like dropped the ball. We need to let the, all of that go because that orphan heart can't be healed and the orphan spirit can't be broken if there remains unforgiveness, offense, bitterness, and resentment. And then it opens doors to demons. That's just the worst part about it. 
You know, when people say, I'm going to hold on to unforgiveness. Yeah, you don't want to do that because it's going to make you, it's going to like put you in a cycle of the same bad thing happening all over again and again and again, like in like your mind and in your life, even if those people already moved on and they live their own life and you keep reliving that cycle. God doesn't want you to relive that cycle. Number four, to overcome the orphan spirit and to heal the orphan heart. And that is surround yourself with supportive community. And this is hard for people who felt isolated and rejected and abandoned. Is God designed you to live with others. You surround yourself with the, with the community of believers that can help you overcome feelings of isolation and loneliness. When you begin to put yourself again in that situation and say, no, I'm not going to be here because I'm trying to just fish out feelings of love and acceptance and but I'm going to be here because the Lord calls me to be part of the body and then just lower your guard just a little bit a little bit and let that light in let that love from other people in and then you realize people don't hate you most people no offense they're not even thinking about you sometimes people walk in they think everybody's thinking about them that is the furthest thing that is the most selfish thing we can think most people don't live their life thinking about us. They think about themselves, their own life, their needs, problems and issues. But when you walk into the community, things like joining a small group, things like joining a local church service, things like going to the family gatherings, your family is getting together for dinners, your family is getting together for, you know, picnic or something and you go there, going to the weddings, going to the things that you were invited and, and not just going in superficially and constantly escaping without having any opportunity to connect with somebody on a deeper level but letting yourself go to trust again love again and making yourself vulnerable to get hurt again but i will never get hurt that's not a healthy way to live there is no way you can experience love without ever experiencing hurt. There's no way. You need to be healed so good that you're not afraid to love without the fear of getting hurt. Will you ever get hurt again? Most likely. That's part of life. And that's not the only bad part. The other bad part is most likely you will hurt other people. So to run away from church, run away from community, run away from a small group and say, I'm not going to do that again because I don't want to get hurt again. That's not possible. Now, should we intentionally put ourselves in the same situation where we got hurt? Absolutely not. Should we learn and practice wisdom? Absolutely yes. But part of relationships, part of building friendships with other people, even with our family, is that there is a danger and risk of getting hurt. When we communicate, when we talk, when we express our hurts and we meet with godly, mature, emotionally mature people and they repent, we build a stronger bond. But this idea that I will never be hurt again, I will never trust again, I will never do anything with those people again, that is such a bad way to live because you also will never feel loved again. You will never find friends again. You, you, you cut yourself out from ever experiencing sanctification, which happens through people, not all of it, but a lot of it happens through relationships, frictions that need to be ironed out. For those of us who are kind of more passive, we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. We're not assertive. We need to step out and that happens in relationships. For others of us who are too assertive and we're like dominant all the time and we need to be kind and we need to repent and apologize, that also happens in relationships. Relationships are so messy and there is no way where you can protect yourself ever from getting hurt if you want to live a life of fully human and Christian in the community. So immerse yourself, be wise, but be in a community. There's some of you, you stopped going to church, not because the music is bad, because you got hurt. You got hurt and you're like, I won't trust pastors again. I won't trust Christians again. I won't go to small groups. It gives me triggers. Yeah, I understand. Maybe don't go to that church. Maybe you don't trust that pastor. 
But don't say that you don't trust every pastor. Not every pastor is, is a crook. I'll never get married. Why? Because every man is a pervert. Not really. Maybe that man you were married to was a pervert. Not every man is a pervert. Jesus wasn't a pervert. He was a man. Don't curse your future because the enemy stole your past. Go into a community. It's not good for men to be alone. We're meant. We're members of the body. We're supposed to come in contact with everyone. And just because you don't like someone, it doesn't mean you should curse everyone and walk away from that. I've experienced some things in our church that were very painful. Some things by some people that were close to me. And today we laugh about it. You know, I've forgiven them. They've forgiven me. Well, it was more like I was forgiving them in some instances where I was hurt. But there were other instances where I hurt them. Maybe not intentionally. And the relationships that I have with them today, with some of them, they're so much deeper and closer. Because it took 20 years. There are scars that have become testimonies and have become part of our joy and we have become so much better. Same thing even with my wife in the beginning stages of our marriage. And if, if I would just simply isolate and say, no, I, I won't, I won't put myself, I won't let myself get hurt again. I won't let myself get hurt again. I'm just going to leave her. I'm going to leave the church and I'm going to live on the island and be by myself or I will be in relationships but put my guard so high that even God cannot penetrate that. My friends, some of the healings will happen not only through your identity, not only through the love, and not only through forgiveness, but learning to trust again, slowly. Learning to be vulnerable again and learning to put yourself in situations where there is a risk of getting hurt potentially. As long as people are involved, you are at risk to getting hurt. It doesn't matter how holy those people are. People are people. And they could be unintentionally saying something, assuming that, da, 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 where you can get hurt. Surround yourself with good community. Now, I am in no way advocating staying in abusive, physically abusive, verbally abusive, sexually abusive, or toxic environments. If you are in an environment where you are being sexually abused, you have to go to the police. You have to run from that place. If you're in a place where you're physically being beaten, whether it's your mom, dad, we're not talking about spanking, but you're talking about being physically beaten. You got to report that. You got to run away from that. The Bible does not condone physical abuse. If you're in a relationships where you're being verbally abused, yeah, that's going to keep on growing that orphan heart, the fear of people pleasing. Run away from that. Overcome that fear and run away from those relationships. If you are in a place in the church where you are spiritually abused and you can't leave without the threats of something bad happening to you and you feel like it's like a cult, run from that place like from a plague. Oh, I just forgave them. Yes, you forgave them and then make sure they go to jail. Forgiveness does not mean you trust that place again. I'm saying to trust people generally. I'm not saying to trust exactly the same person again unless there was a genuine repentance and you're seeing the fruits of changed behavior. But this idea that I've forgiven, I find my identity in Jesus and you intentionally put yourself in exactly the same place with the same person. That is not love, that is just bad. I wanted to say another word, but it's more stronger and negative. And so that is just bad, wrong and unwise. <laughs> is this helping anybody? Drop number one in the chat. If this is helping someone already, if you are just tuning in, welcome. Make sure that you hit like to the, to the live stream as well as um, share this with other people. I have one more thing that I want to share and then we're going to pray. One more um, way to overcome an orphan spirit and then we're going to pray. And this uh, last one is like, it's like, a, it's like a cherry on the top of the cake. Like that is what's going to solidify all of that process, you know. Um, so let's review on how to overcome the orphan spirit. First one is we trust in God's love. We experience that love and we also 
know that love through the scripture because Jesus died on the cross for us. Secondly, is we embrace our identity in Jesus. We must remind ourselves constantly, Jesus not only died for us, that's substitution, we died with Him and that's inclusion. We were included with Christ. Christians are in Jesus. The third thing is we must forgive those people that have hurt us. We must let go of the offense, hurt, and those wounds will turn into scars and the scars will be part of our testimony. The fourth thing is we must surround ourselves with supportive community. We might not be in the same community where we got hurt, but we still have to be in a Christian godly community of emotionally and spiritually mature believers who can help us to feel loved again and help us to overcome the feelings of isolation and loneliness. But we mentioned, even if you go into that community, the potential and the risk of you getting hurt are still always going to be there. You will never be able to live your life where you will never ever get hurt again. You'll just have to be more wiser, more mature, and handle those hurts better. The last thing that we must do to overcome an orphan spirit is we have to focus on serving others. Serving others can give us a sense of purpose and belonging. The moment you begin to think of every environment as a place where it serves you, you're not going to really overcome the orphan spirit. When you begin to look at every environment and instead of saying, how can they honor me? How can they promote me? How can they recognize me? How can they fix me? How can they make me feel belonged? How can I find friends there? That's a wrong way of looking at it. But if you look at every environment, from a point of view, I am loved by Jesus. I'm going to church to love other people. I'm going to church to be a friend to other people. I'm going to church not so people can tickle my ears, serve me. I'm going to serve others. I'm going to a small group, not just to find friends, but to be a friend. I'm going to serve, not just be served. So then your focus is not on your emotions, your feelings, your ego, your self-esteem. Your focus is on other people. And something begins to happen. Usually the things that you start to give out to other people, they seem to reciprocate and come into your life. And you begin to experience more joy, more, more friends, more opportunities, more invitations to, you know, birthday parties or, or, or things that you, where you're like, man, I feel like my life is full of life. My life is full of joy. I am loved. I am, I do belong. I have a sense of purpose. I have a sense of meaning. You know, I'm no longer viewed like that. People speak good about me, not because you were fishing for it, not because you were going intentionally with that motive, but because you changed your perspective. You're like, I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing that for them. I'm doing that for God. I'm doing that for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And as a result, you start reaping those things without seeking them. But intention, initially, when you are insecure and you are offended and you have a sense of entitlement, orphan heart, you always go to those environments. And though you serve, but like internally, in your motives, you really are there for you. It's really self-driven and the moment they don't like serve you right away, they don't give you what you really need, you get frustrated and you just like, I quit, I give up, I'm not being recognized, I'm not being honored, I'm being treated unfairly because it's really always been about you. It's not been about people and the reason why it's been about you is because you're hurting, it's because you're suffering, because you're bleeding, because you got rejected, because you got hurt and those things didn't get resolved and so today you need to let that go. Today you need to invite Jesus into those painful moments of your life and say, Jesus, heal me. Jesus, get me out of this. Jesus, uh, put your oil on me. Jesus, help me to know my identity in you, not in what people said I am, the labels that they gave me. Jesus, could you, through the Holy Spirit, pour love of God into my heart? I release that forgiveness. I release forgiveness to those people. I let go of unforgiveness and Jesus, I change my perspective. I'm not going to live for me. I will live like you did. For the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. That's going to be my motto. I live for God and I live to help others. I live to bring a blessing to others. And if they give me something in return, like recognition and, and blessing, bonus. If they don't give me anything, not offended. Why? I wasn't doing it for that in the first place. I was doing it out of a pure motive. Because I'm healthy. Because I know who I am. Because I'm whole. Because I'm loved. I can give love. I'm not a beggar. I'm not this needy, like a constantly draining life out of everybody, sucking life out of the room. Why? Because I'm so easily offended. Everybody has to walk on tiptoes around me. 
Why? Because I'm just, I'm, I can tr get triggered anytime. I can get angry anytime. And that's not a healthy place to be because we're actually not serving people. We're trying to use people to fix our hurts, wounds, and our pain. So that is some of the ways we can do to overcome the orphan heart and the orphan spirit. Amen. Um, let's pray. I see somebody saying emotional vampire. Yes, emotional vampire. When you are insecure, orphan heart, you un unintentionally become an emotional vampire. You suck life out of others. And you don't want to, you don't intend to. It's just you're so empty that you, you can't give. You're constantly receiving, 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 but it's never enough, never enough. You can't appreciate what people give to you. And then when they give to you, because it's not enough, you feel like it's not real what they gave you. They didn't really mean this compliment. They didn't really mean that. Constantly questioning anybody. And then people after a while, they're like, man, you don't appreciate it. I'm going to stop giving it to you. So just, just live your own life. And then, of course, we take that as a sign of rejection and abandonment, which adds to that idea that we already carry. We're not loved. We're not, we're not accepted. The church hates people. This church is not good. And some churches are not good. That's true. But sometimes there's just not good stuff in us. Orphan heart and spirit must be addressed. So let me ask you a question. Have you been rejected? Abandoned? Left alone? Wounded? Maybe it's your boyfriend who cheated on you, your husband who left you. Or perhaps you grew up in a, in a home where mom and dad always fought. And you were like grass that suffered when elephants fight. You suffered from that. You, have to, you had to find love in other places. And you found that love in other places that turned out not to be love but lust. Come to Jesus right now. You may be a Christian. But ask Jesus to heal your heart. Tell Him what hurts you. Tell Him you're hurt. Don't blame those people. But also don't, don't blame yourself. Just tell Him of what happened. Say, Jesus, could you heal me right now? Say, Jesus, could you pour your love into the broken parts of my life? If that still hurts, invite Him into that part right now. Also, just forgive those people. Say, Lord, I forgive my family members. I forgive that uncle. I forgive my dad who maybe wasn't there. I forgive my parents who gave me up for adoption. I forgive that abusive parent. I forgive that person that took advantage of me. I forgive those people that bullied me, made fun of me. I forgive Jesus, ex-husband, somebody who cheated, somebody who caused me pain and suffering, maybe a boss, a pastor, a leader. I forgive them, Lord. Please pour your love into my heart right now, Lord. Help me to know my identity in you. I choose your word. Just pray those prayers. Say, I choose your truth. Jesus, I don't identify with my marital status as my source of identity, from my gender as my source of identity, my income as the source of my identity. My identity, Jesus, it comes from you. I'm loved. I'm blessed. I'm justified. I'm no longer condemned. I'm a new creation. I'm your child. I'm your disciple. And if the church demoted you and you have greater education or experience and maybe in your job you got demoted and you feel like a failure, don't make your job, your position an idol. Your identity is in Christ. Identity in Jesus. Say, Jesus, I love you. And you are my identity. I identify with you, Lord. Recommit to the local church right now. Just make a decision to go back to a small group. Maybe that small group is too toxic. Go to a different one. Give God's body, Jesus' body, 
a second chance, a third chance. Remember, those people need you and you need them. Remember, you can never live your life or you'll never ever get hurt, disappointed. And sometimes you'll be the one causing disappointment and hurt. That other people have to forgive you and experience, learn forgiveness because of your mess, my mess. And lastly, what I'm asking you to do right now is, dear Jesus, could you help us? Because of the healing that takes place right now, because of the forgiveness that is taking place right now, because of the love that is being poured out right now, would you help us, Lord, to shift our perspective and not to go into environments as beggars, but as generous lovers, servants. Lord, you said leadership is servanthood, that we go serving, not as this chronic bad view that we're just being slaves. Give us a new mindset that it's a joy, it's an opportunity, it's a privilege to serve the local church, people that we work with, people that we work for, and people that work for us, our spouses, our children. It's a joy to serve them. And as a result, we will reap the benefits. Lord, but we're not doing it for the benefits. We're doing it because you're making us whole, healthy, and healed. In Jesus' name, amen. Drop that prayer emoji in the chat. If this is the word that you really needed today, and you received that word, come on somebody, want to invite you. This is our last day of the fast, um, the third day of the stream. Would you um, consider becoming a partner with us? If this was the word in season for you, I want to invite you to um, today give toward this ministry. Um, you're not giving for, you know, to get the word, the word is free, uh, but help us to bring just more of teachings like these to many, many people. We do that. Millions of people we reach that through videos every month, and then thousands of people we reach through our books, our material. And those of you who know my ministry, you know that in our ministry we do sl things slightly different. We offer those things free of charge, and so. But we are able to do that because of people like you guys, like you guys. And so, I just wanted to say first and foremost. Thank you for doing that. And secondly, I want to invite you for those who have never done it or who have done it, but not as a partner, consider becoming a partner. You can give through Cash App, Venmo, PayPal or other things, one-time donation, or you can become a monthly partner. And this will just help us to kind of uh, plan for more projects, uh, knowing that we have a team that's walking with us praying for this ministry and supporting this ministry financially. So I just want to say appreciate you, uh, thank you for doing that and, um, and those links are being dropped in the comments below.